The door opened slightly, and there before me was the raw truth, Laura and Jason, both turning to look at me with shock and fear in their eyes. Before we begin, are you ready to hear a story that could change the way you see life? If so, comment BEGIN below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any new updates. I grew up in a small town, one of those places where the streets go quiet at dusk and people still wave as they pass by on their way to work or the grocery store. My life was simple and quiet, filled with early mornings and late nights, hard work and modest dreams. There was a rhythm to it, a kind of peace in knowing where each day would lead, the satisfaction of honest labor. I was never one for extravagance or risk. I preferred the familiar, the steady, something dependable to hold on to in a world that felt more unpredictable by the day. From a young age, I had learned the value of discipline and savings. My parents had raised me with strong values, teaching me to appreciate what I had and to work hard for what I wanted. I watched my father labor at the steel mill, his hands calloused and rough, his voice deep and steady. And my mother, who took care of us and managed the household with a patience that seemed endless, taught me the importance of kindness and resilience. They never had much, but they had enough, and they shared a love that was unshakable, a love I always wanted to find for myself someday. I spent my twenties dedicated to my career, saving up every extra dollar, living well within my means. I didn't mind the small sacrifices, like skipping out on expensive nights out or choosing practicality over luxury. There was a pride in knowing that I was building something of my own, slowly but surely. Friends would joke that I was too focused, that I was letting life pass me by. But I didn't mind. I liked the quiet, the routine, the sense of control over my path. And then Laura came into my life. She was unlike anyone I'd ever known. Driven, focused, with an energy that felt contagious. I met her through work, and our conversations were casual at first, just polite exchanges over coffee breaks or lunch meetings. But something about her made me curious. Laura had this determination about her, like she was always chasing something bigger, and it drew me in. She talked about her dreams and goals, her training for the Ironman competition, her dedication to a strict vegan diet and grueling fitness regime. It was admirable and intense, a kind of passion I hadn't seen in anyone before. Slowly, our casual lunches turned into something more. Uh, we'd meet up after work, sometimes just to talk or to share a meal. She'd introduce me to new foods, different ways of looking at life, pulling me out of the steady rhythm I'd built for myself. With Laura, I found myself daring to imagine a different future, one filled with excitement and change. She made me feel alive in a way I hadn't before, shaking up my once simple and predictable life with her laughter and stories. Falling in love with Laura was like stepping into a new world. I felt as though I was finally catching up on everything I'd missed, like my years of hard work and careful planning had been leading to this, finding someone to share it all with. She challenged me to be better, to step out of my comfort zone, and in return I gave her my loyalty in my heart, believing we were building something strong and true. Looking back, those early days with Laura felt almost dreamlike. There was so much hope, so much promise of a future we could create together. When I, when I first really got to know Laura, it was over a, a cup of black coffee right after a long day. I remember how she laughed as she slid into the seat across from me, her face flushed and her eyes bright. Half the room looked like that presentation, she asked, rolling her eyes. Half the room looked like it'd rather be anywhere else. <laughs> I chuckled, nodding. It was brutal, I replied. But you made it interesting. I'm not sure how you pulled it off. She shrugged, a small, proud smile lifting her lips. It's about confidence, Jacob. You have to own the room or else the room owns you. Her words came out with such conviction, like it was the simplest truth in the world. For Laura, maybe it was. 
Over time, our coffee dates turned into dinners, and those dinners turned into late-night walks. I saw her competitive spirit in full force and admired her intensity. She was relentless, not just in her work but in her personal life too. Laura wasn't afraid to take risks or speak her mind, and she pushed me to do the same. One evening, while we were out walking, she stopped suddenly. Jacob, what do you want out of life? She asked, her gaze piercing. I hesitated, caught off guard by her question. I... I want stability, I guess. I stammered. I want a good life. Something solid. Nothing too wild. I gave her a small, self-conscious smile, unsure if she'd understand. Laura shook her head, her expression unreadable. <laughs> You're too careful, Jacob, she said with a soft laugh. Life is meant to be lived boldly, don't you think? You've got to take chances. Otherwise, what's the point? Her words hit me like a splash of cold water. I realized then how different we were, but maybe that was what made her so irresistible to me. Soon enough, we found ourselves spending nearly every day together. She dragged me to her favorite places, each with a story behind it. This is where I decided I wanted to do the Iron Man. She told me one afternoon at a small cafe by the river. She went on about her grueling training schedule, her vegan diet, her commitment to pushing her body to the limit. Her dedication was intense, almost intimidating, but there was a light in her eyes that made it impossible not to listen. Jacob, she said, one evening, over one of our many vegan dinners she insisted on, you have to try this lifestyle. You might just find yourself a little stronger than you think. She grinned, nudging my plate closer to me. I took a bite of the tofu she'd ordered, raising an eyebrow as I chewed. It's different, I said, trying to be polite, though the taste wasn't exactly what I'd hoped for. She laughed at my expression, playfully rolling her eyes. <laughs> You're impossible, she teased, but I'll get you on board eventually. Her laughter was contagious, filling the room, and I felt myself smile despite the odd meal. There was something about her that made me want to change, to try new things, to be the kind of man she might be proud of. I'd never felt that way before. One night, after a long day, she opened up to me in a way I hadn't expected. We were sitting on the couch in her small apartment, sharing a bottle of wine, when she sighed, looking down at her hands. Jacob, there's something I should tell you. She began, her voice soft. I looked at her, feeling a sudden wave of worry. What's wrong? I asked gently, reaching out to take her hand. She took a deep breath. I don't do things halfway, she said, meeting my gaze with a fierce intensity. If we're doing this, if we're really together, I need you to know I'm all in. And I need you to be all in, too. No half measures, no second thoughts. Her eyes searched mine, waiting. I'm all in, Laura, I replied without hesitation, my voice steady. I could see the relief in her face, a small smile breaking through her serious expression. I meant every word. She had become a part of my life in a way I couldn't have anticipated, and I was ready to face whatever came our way. Our relationship felt like a whirlwind, each day a new chapter in a story I hadn't planned on living. And though I was nervous, I was also excited. Being with Laura felt like standing at the edge of something vast and unknown, a place where I'd have to let go of my need for stability and trust in the journey. The first few months of marriage felt like a dream, one I'd imagined for years. Laura and I shared a tiny but cozy apartment, filled with laughter, late-night conversations, and plans for the future. She'd bring home new vegan recipes, and we'd experiment in our little kitchen, burning some dishes, perfecting others. Everything felt right, like our lives were finally clicking into place. But soon, cracks began to appear, small at first, almost unnoticeable. 
It started with Lara's commitment to her Iron Man training. She'd been passionate about it even before we met, but now it was something else entirely, a relentless obsession. She quit her job to train full-time, spending hours at the gym with her new coach, Jason Hendrick. At first, I supported her dream wholeheartedly, but as time went on, I began to notice just how much she was sacrificing and how much I was expected to bear. One evening, after a long day at work, I found her sitting at the kitchen table, staring at her training schedule with a focused intensity. Hey, you've been at it all day, I said, setting my bag down. How about we take a break and watch a movie or something? Without looking up, she shook her head. I can't. I need to go over my schedule for tomorrow, make sure I'm hitting my targets. Her voice was distant, almost mechanical. Laura, I said softly, it's just one evening. You deserve a break, too. She looked up at me, a hint of irritation in her eyes. Jacob, I'm not supposed to be competitive. I can't afford to slack off. You knew this was important to me when we got married. I nodded, biting my tongue, feeling a pang of disappointment. It was like I was losing her to this all-consuming goal, this dream that seemed to push everything else, including our relationship, into the background. And as the weeks passed, that feeling only grew stronger. Financially, we were stretched thin. With Laura out of work, I took on extra hours, sometimes late shifts, to make up for the loss. I didn't mind, at first, telling myself it was temporary, that once she finished training, things would go back to normal. But normal never came. Every time I brought up the financial strain, Laura brushed it off, saying it would all be worth it once she achieved her dream. I wanted to believe her, but as bills piled up, it became harder to ignore the tension building between us. Then there was her coach, Jason. I didn't like him from the start, but I tried to keep my concerns to myself, not wanting to seem overprotective. He was always around, always pushing her harder, always demanding more. One evening, I decided to surprise her at the gym, hoping to watch a bit of her training and show my support. As I walked in, I saw them... Jason's hands on her shoulders, guiding her in a way that felt far too familiar. I felt my stomach twist a sickening pang of jealousy mixed with suspicion. I approached them, my voice calm but strained. Laura, can I talk to you for a moment? She looked surprised, glancing at Jason before nodding. Of course. What's wrong? Away from him, I took a deep breath. I don't like how close he is with you, I admitted, feeling a mix of shame and frustration. It doesn't feel professional. Laura's eyes narrowed. Jacob, he's my coach. This is what he does. He knows what I need to succeed. You're overreacting. Am I? I asked, my voice rising. You've changed, Laura. You spend all your time with him, with this training. Where does that leave us? She looked at me with a mixture of pity and annoyance as if I were some naive kid who didn't understand the seriousness of her goals. If you can't handle it, Jacob, maybe you should ask yourself why. This is my life now. I need you to support me, not question everything. Her words stung, leaving me feeling smaller and more distant than I'd ever felt before. I wanted to fight back, to tell her how I was working myself to the bone to keep us afloat, how I missed the woman I'd fallen in love with, but I couldn't find the words. She had already turned away, her focus back on her training. That night I lay awake in bed, feeling a growing sense of despair. Laura was there beside me, but she felt miles away. The woman who once laughed with me over burnt dinners, who shared her dreams with me, had become a stranger, and no matter how hard I tried to bridge the gap between us, it seemed that her dream was all that mattered now. I felt powerless, stuck in a marriage that was slipping through my fingers. A few weeks after that gym incident, things only got worse. I kept telling myself it would all balance out, that maybe I was just overreacting, but deep down I could feel a growing storm brewing between us, one that I was powerless to stop. I'd come home each night to an empty apartment, 
the only trace of Laura a few scattered belongings and a protein shake left on the counter. She was almost always at the gym, and when she was home, she barely looked at me. I missed her, missed us. It felt like I was married to a ghost. One night, I decided I couldn't stay silent anymore. I waited for her to come home, pacing the living room, rehearsing what I'd say, trying to keep my emotions in check. Finally, around nine o'clock, I heard her key in the door. She stepped in, drenched in sweat, a tired yet satisfied look on her face. Hey, I greeted, trying to sound casual. Long day? She nodded, barely glancing at me. Yeah, Jason had me doing extra sprints. He says I need to push harder if I want to make real progress. Jason, I repeated, unable to hide the bitterness in my tone. It's always Jason, isn't it? She looked at me, her eyes narrowing. What's that supposed to mean? I took a deep breath, trying to keep my voice steady. It means that I feel like you're more married to your training and to him than you are to me. Laura, we barely see each other anymore. You're never here, and when you are, it's like I don't exist. She sighed, her face hardening. Jacob, we've been over this. This is important to me. I'm putting everything into this because I believe in it. Why can't you support me instead of making it about you? It's not about me, Laura, I replied, my frustration boiling over. It's about us. It's about the fact that I'm working myself to exhaustion just to keep us afloat while you quit your job to follow some pipe dream. And Jason, don't you see how it looks? How much time you spend with him? Her expression shifted a flicker of anger crossing her face. Jason believes in me, Jacob. He's helping me achieve something that matters to me. Why, why are you so threatened by that? Threatened? I scoffed, feeling my hands clench into fists. I'm not threatened, Laura. I'm your husband, and I feel like I'm losing you to this obsession. I don't even recognize you anymore. She glared at me, her jaw set. Maybe if you'd try to understand instead of always criticizing, you wouldn't think that way. Maybe you'd see that this isn't just a phase or an obsession. It's my life, Jacob. And if you can't handle that, maybe you should take a look at why you're so insecure. <laughs> insecure? I laughed bitterly, the sound harsh even to my own ears. I'm insecure because I'm worried about my marriage because I'm watching you drift further and further away, putting all your energy into training and leaving me in the dust? She crossed her arms, her eyes cold. I'm sorry if my ambitions make you uncomfortable, Jacob, but I'm not going to apologize for wanting more than the simple life you're so satisfied with. The words cut deep like a slap in the face. She'd never said it outright before, but I could feel it now, that quiet resentment she harbored for my stable, grounded dreams. I stood there, feeling like everything I'd worked for, everything I'd thought we shared, was unraveling right in front of me. Maybe I'm not enough for you, then, I said quietly, my voice barely a whisper. Laura's face softened for a moment, but just as quickly she looked away, her shoulders tense. Maybe, maybe we both just want different things. There it was, the brutal honesty we'd both been avoiding. For a moment we just stood there, the weight of her words hanging between us like a wall that couldn't be torn down. I wanted to say something, to bridge the gap between us, but no words came. Um, and, uh, and finally she spoke again, her tone distant. Look, I'm exhausted. I don't want to keep arguing. Let's just drop it, okay? Sure, I replied, feeling numb. Uh, let's just drop it. She turned and walked toward the bedroom without another word, leaving me alone in the silence of our darkened living room. I felt an emptiness settle over me, a deep ache that no words could fix. I sank onto the couch, burying my face in my hands, wondering how we'd gotten to this point how the woman I loved, the one I'd built a life with, had turned into a stranger right before my eyes. 
and for the first time I found myself wondering if love alone was enough to bridge the growing distance between us, or if, despite everything, it was already too late. Packing up my life from that little apartment was both surreal and heart-wrenching. I could still remember the excitement I'd felt when we'd first moved in, lugging boxes up the stairs and making plans for our future. Now, every item I placed in my suitcase felt like another piece of us slipping away, another reminder of what we'd once shared and lost. It was early morning and the apartment was quiet, with only the sound of birds chirping outside the window. Laura was still asleep in the bedroom, oblivious to the decision I'd made. I hadn't wanted to confront her again. Our last argument had drained every ounce of energy I had left. Instead, I moved through the room silently, collecting my things, each small item tugging at memories that felt bittersweet now. Our wedding photo on the shelf, the mug she'd given me when we'd first started dating, my half of the closet slowly emptying with each shirt I folded and packed. I'd thought about this for weeks the idea of leaving growing stronger with each argument, each lonely night when she stayed late at the gym, leaving me alone with my doubts and frustrations. I had tried everything, talking, reasoning, supporting her in every way I knew how, but it had only pushed her further away. The Laura I'd fallen in love with was hidden somewhere behind this iron wall of ambition and stubborn independence, a wall I couldn't break down no matter how hard I tried. As I placed the last of my clothes in the suitcase, I heard a soft shuffle from behind. I turned to see Laura standing in the doorway, her eyes still heavy with sleep, her hair tousled. She looked at the suitcase, her face a mix of confusion and faint recognition. Jacob, what are you doing? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I swallowed hard, steadying myself. I'm leaving, Laura. <clears throat> I'm afraid that this won't be under control anymore. <laughs> her face shifted, a flicker of something that almost looked like regret passing over her features, but it was gone as quickly as it had appeared. She crossed her arms, leaning against the doorframe, her gaze steely. So, that's it? You're just going to walk away? I nodded, my heart aching. What else can I do? I've tried, Laura. I've done everything I can to make this work, but it feels like I'm the only one who cares about us anymore. She looked away, her jaw tight. I care, Jacob. I care about my future. I care about what I want to achieve. Why is that so hard for you to understand? It's not hard to understand, I replied, my voice shaking. But what about us, Laura? What about the life we were supposed to build together? You're not in this marriage anymore. You're in a relationship with, with your training, with your coach, with this dream that's leaving no space for me. She stared at me, her silence cutting deeper than any words could. I waited, hoping she'd say something to change my mind, to give me a reason to stay. But the silence lingered, filling the room with a cold finality. I'll be staying in the trailer for now. I said quietly, lifting the suitcase. You can keep the apartment. I don't need it. Laura nodded, her expression unreadable. Fine, she said simply, her tone cold and detached. I took a deep breath, feeling a strange mix of sorrow and relief as I walked past her, suitcase in hand. The woman I loved, the one I'd shared so much with, stood there, watching me go without a single word to stop me. Part of me hoped, maybe even prayed, that she'd reach out, that she'd say something to bring me back. But she didn't. Her silence was louder than anything she could have said. As I stepped out of the apartment and closed the door behind me, a heavy weight settled in my chest. This wasn't how I'd imagined our story ending. I'd pictured a life together, filled with love and compromise, not this hollow goodbye that left me feeling both lost and strangely free. I felt like I was walking away from everything I had ever wanted, but I also knew that staying would only tear me apart even more. The air outside felt crisp, the early morning light casting long shadows on the street as I walked to my car. 
I loaded my suitcase into the back, glancing up at the window one last time. I half expected to see her standing there, watching me go, maybe even calling out my name. But the window was empty, silent, just like our marriage had become. As I started the engine and pulled away, I felt a tear slip down my cheek, a quiet acknowledgement of everything we'd built and lost. The drive to the trailer felt like a blur, my mind replaying every memory, every moment we'd shared, every laugh, every kiss, every argument. And with each mile I felt a little piece of myself let go, accepting that this was the end of our chapter. When I finally arrived at the trailer, I parked, sat in silence for a moment, and let the reality sink in. I was on my own now, stepping into a future I hadn't planned for. It hurt deeply, but beneath the sadness, there was a quiet determination, a resolve to move forward, even if it meant starting over alone. Sitting alone in that small trailer, surrounded by the few things I'd brought with me, I felt the weight of everything finally settle in. The silence was deafening, filling the space where Laura's laughter, our late-night conversations, and the soft hum of everyday life used to be. I thought I'd prepared myself for this moment, convinced myself that walking away was the only choice left. But nothing could have prepared me for the hollow ache that seemed to settle deep inside, one that felt impossible to ignore. The days blurred together after I left. I tried to keep myself busy, filling my time with work, errands, anything to distract myself from the gnawing sense of loss that lingered no matter what I did. I'd find myself reaching for my phone to text Laura, only to remember that things weren't the same anymore. She was there, in that apartment, probably training harder than ever while I was here, trying to piece together what was left of my life without her. I'd catch myself replaying our last conversation, going over every word, every pause, wondering if there was something I could have said differently, some way to have reached her, but each time I hit the same wall. It was as if she'd already decided who she wanted to be, and that person didn't include me. I felt like an outsider in my own life, watching helplessly as everything I'd built with her crumbled away. One night, lying awake on the thin mattress in the trailer, memories of the life we'd shared flooded my mind. I remembered the early days of our relationship, the way her eyes would light up when she talked about her dreams, the way she'd tease me for my steady routines, telling me I was too cautious. Back then I'd loved that about her, her fire, her determination. But now it was that same fire that had burned a hole through us, leaving nothing but ash in its place. I wanted to hate her, to blame her for everything that had gone wrong, but all I felt was this crushing sadness, a sadness that seemed to grow heavier with each passing day. I missed her. Miss the person she used to be. Miss the person I used to be when I was with her. I felt like I'd lost not just my wife, but a part of myself as well. A part that I didn't know how to get back. One evening I sat by the small table in the trailer, looking at an old photo of us that I'd kept. It was from our wedding day, her smile wide and radiant, my arm wrapped around her as if I could protect her from the world. I could almost hear her laugh, feel the warmth of her hand in mine. But that person felt like a stranger now, someone I'd known in a different lifetime. I traced my finger over the edge of the photo, feeling the familiar sting of tears welling up. Did it have to end like this? I whispered into the empty room, my voice cracking. I wanted answers, but there were none. Laura had become so focused on her goals, on this vision of who she wanted to be, that I'd become little more than a footnote in her story. And maybe that was what hurt the most, that realization that, in the end, I wasn't enough. I'd poured everything I had into our marriage, sacrificed my own dreams, worked longer hours, all for a future that she'd abandoned. The helplessness gnawed at me, a feeling that no matter how hard I'd tried, nothing would change. I couldn't go back and fix things, couldn't uh, make her see what she'd thrown away. I was stuck, 
trapped in this loop of memories and regrets, haunted by the ghosts of what we used to be. I, I tried to push the memories aside, to focus on moving forward, but it was like trying to hold back a tidal wave with my bare hands. Each memory, each reminder of her, felt like a fresh wound reopening and bleeding with a pain that seemed endless. There were days when I wondered if I'd ever feel whole again, if I'd ever be able to look at my life and not see the empty space where she used to be. The worst part was the loneliness. It wasn't just the absence of her presence, it was the absence of who I'd been with her. She'd brought out parts of me I hadn't even known existed, pieces that now felt shattered, scattered beyond repair. I wanted to move on to find some kind of peace, but each step felt heavy like I was dragging the weight of our broken marriage behind me. In moments of weakness, I'd think about calling her, hearing her voice just once more. But I knew that wouldn't bring any comfort. Only more pain. <laughs> Laura had made her choice, and I had to learn how to live with that even if it meant facing the hollow silence alone. And so I sat there in the trailer, surrounded by memories and regrets, feeling the weight of a future that felt as empty as the present. I clenched the wheel tightly, the motel sign glowing dimly in the evening haze. The name Jason had given Laura's location away, and I'd managed to find her car parked in the corner, hidden from the main entrance, as if that could somehow hide the betrayal. Part of me didn't want to be here, didn't want to see what I already knew deep down, but something stronger had taken over, a need to confront, to make her feel the weight of everything she'd done. I'd brought Zeke, my oldest friend, along. He'd seen my frustration over the past few months, the way I'd slowly unraveled, and when I told him what I'd found out, he'd volunteered to come without hesitation. Let's end this, man, he'd said, his voice filled with a kind of righteous anger I wished I could muster. Together, we'd hatched a plan that would make sure she couldn't ignore what she'd done. The motel owner was more than willing to help after hearing my story, handing over the spare key with a look that said he'd seen it all before. Room 12, he muttered, glancing toward the corridor. J just be careful, all right? I nodded, trying to steady my breathing as I took the key, feeling the cold metal press into my palm. Zeke clapped a reassuring hand on my shoulder. We go in, get what we came for, and get out, he reminded me, his voice low but firm. With a deep breath, I slipped the key into the lock and turned it. The door opened with a quiet click, and we stepped inside. The air was thick, smelling faintly of cheap perfume and stale cigarettes, and there, tangled together on the bed, were Laura and Jason, their faces turning to us with shock and confusion as they scrambled to pull the sheets over themselves. Jacob! Laura gasped, her eyes wide. W what are you doing here? I felt a surge of rage so intense it was almost blinding. I could ask you the same thing, I spat, keeping my voice steady, though every part of me was ready to explode. But I think the answer's pretty clear, isn't it? Jason glared, his face twisting with annoyance. Look, man, I don't know what you think this is, but I cut him off, stepping closer, my fists clenched. I know exactly what this is, I said coldly, my voice low. You think you can sneak around behind my back, mess with my marriage, and get away with it? Laura reached out, her hand trembling as she tried to grab mine. Jacob, please, let's just talk about this. Talk? I laughed bitterly, shaking her hand off. Now you want to talk? After all those times I tried to make this work, tried to be there for you, this is how you repay me? I looked at her, the woman I once loved, now a stranger tangled up in a mess of her own making. Before she could respond, Zeke moved to the side of the bed, gathering her belongings, her purse, her clothes, even the shoes she'd kicked off by the door. He shoved them into a bag with quick, efficient movements, barely looking at her. You won't be needing these here anymore, 
he said flatly, tossing the bag onto the floor beside me. <laughs> Jason scoffed, his tone dripping with disdain. You're both pathetic, coming in here like some rescue squad. Laura's not your property, Jacob. I took a slow, steady breath, leveling my gaze at him. No, she's not, and that's fine, because she clearly doesn't want to be. But that doesn't mean you get to walk away from this like nothing happened. <laughs> With a nod to Zeke, I pulled out my phone, snapping pictures of the scene. Laura covered her face, her voice rising in panic. Jacob, stop. What are you doing? Getting some insurance, I replied calmly. Because when we're done, Laura, you won't just be losing me. You'll be losing the life you thought you'd walk away from so easily. Jason tried to step forward, but Zeke blocked his path, his arms crossed. I wouldn't if I were you, Zeke warned, his voice calm but menacing. We're here to settle a score. You're not going anywhere until he's finished. I turned to Laura one last time, feeling an odd sense of satisfaction at her tearful, desperate expression. Consider this the last time we ever speak, Laura, I said coldly. You threw away everything we built together for... this. I glanced at Jason, who looked more like a fool wrapped in a tangled bedsheet than the coach she'd spent months defending. Turning on my heel, I grabbed the bag with her things and walked out, Zeke following close behind. We left them there, humiliated and exposed, in the silence of that dingy room. As Zeke and I stepped out of the motel room, I felt a strange mix of emotions boiling up inside me. Anger, hurt, disbelief, but, oddly enough, a flicker of satisfaction as well. I hadn't wanted to end things this way, but seeing Laura and Jason's stunned, desperate expressions back there gave me a sense of justice I hadn't known I needed. For months, I had been drowning in doubt and frustration, wondering what was wrong with me, with us and finally I saw the truth laid bare. We walked back to the car in silence, Zeke still carrying Laura's bag. When we reached the car, he handed it to me, raising an eyebrow. So, what now, man? he asked, his tone both supportive and cautious. I glanced down at the bag, feeling the weight of everything inside, her belongings, pieces of a life that had shattered before my eyes. Now, I replied, tossing the bag onto the ground beside the car. We make sure she knows exactly what she lost. I grabbed the bag, rummaging through it until I found her wallet, taking out every card she'd had linked to my account. Her gym membership, the credit card she'd been using for months to support her training, all of it would be gone by the end of the night. If she wanted to start a new life without me, she could do it without a single cent from me. As I cut up the cards, Zeke watched quietly, nodding with a grim approval. She had it coming, Jacob. Don't doubt that, he said, his voice calm. After everything she put you through, you've earned this. I nodded, but deep down, there was a pang of sorrow mixed in with the satisfaction. This was the woman I'd loved, the woman I'd once built dreams with, and now I was standing here, dismantling what was left of that life piece by piece. It felt surreal, almost absurd that things had ended up like this, but as I looked at the pile of shredded plastic at my feet, a sense of release washed over me. Zeke patted me on the bag. I, how, how about one last stop, he suggested, his eyes glinting with a spark of mischief. I looked at him, raising an eyebrow. What did you have in mind? He grinned, pulling out his phone. Why don't we pay a little visit to her gym? I've got a friend who works the night shift there. Let's say we leave a parting gift. Without hesitation, we drove to the gym where Laura had spent nearly every waking hour over the past few months. Zeke's friend met us at the door, a knowing look on his face. You here to send a message? He asked, holding the door open for us. Something like that, I replied, feeling a surge of satisfaction as we stepped inside. We made our way to the locker area, finding her locker with ease. Zeke took out a printout of the photos I'd snapped at the motel and taped one to the inside of her locker door, 
a stark reminder of the choices she'd made. Then, as a final touch, I left a note scrawled in black marker on the outside of the locker. Consider this your last training session, Laura. I took a step back, feeling an almost surreal sense of completion. This was it. The end. No more doubts. No more wondering what could have been. I'd given her everything, and she'd thrown it away without a second thought. As we turned to leave, I felt a strange calm settle over me, like the quiet after a long, brutal storm. The drive back was silent, Zeke watching me carefully as I stared out the window, feeling both hollow and strangely free. You all right? he finally asked, his voice low. I nodded slowly, realizing that for the first time in months, I actually was. Yeah, I replied a faint smile tugging at my lips. I think I am. We pulled up to the trailer and Zeke gave me a reassuring nod. You did the right thing, Jacob. Some people don't deserve second chances. I watched him drive off, the night feeling heavier and quieter as I stood alone by the trailer door. I took a deep breath, feeling the weight of everything that had happened, the painful memories, the betrayal, and finally, the end. It hurt, of course it did, but beneath that pain was a steady sense of relief, a realization that I was finally free from the burden of loving someone who couldn't love me back. Stepping into the trailer, I set my keys down, glancing around at the small, simple space. It wasn't much, but it was mine, untouched by her lies and deceit. I grabbed a beer from the fridge, sank into the worn-out couch, and took a long, slow drink feeling the bitterness slide down my throat. For the first time in months, I didn't feel like I was waiting for something to change or for her to come back. I, as I sat there, I could feel the old life I'd tried so hard to hold on to slipping away, making room for something new. I didn't know what was next, didn't have a plan or any grand vision, but maybe that was okay. I'd been living for someone else for so long that I'd forgotten what it meant to live for myself. With one final sigh, I closed my eyes, letting the quiet settle over me. It was over. Here was a man who knew how to overcome even grave difficulties and worthy of it, so bright and brave. The weeks following the motel confrontation were strangely quiet, a stark contrast to the emotional storm that had raged within me for months. For the first time in what felt like forever, I was alone with my own thoughts, not tangled up in anger, disappointment, or regret. The silence was both unsettling and freeing, a blank canvas that I wasn't quite sure how to fill. The divorce paperwork came in sooner than I expected. I'd instructed my lawyer to handle everything swiftly and cleanly. There wasn't much to fight over. I'd left most of our shared possessions with her, along with the apartment. I wanted no reminders, no anchors tying me to the past. It was like shedding an old, worn-out skin, one that had weighed me down for far too long. Signing the papers was almost anticlimactic, just a few strokes of the pen, a final flourish, and it was done. The relief that followed was unexpected, a lightness I hadn't felt in years. Each day, I found myself feeling a little more at peace, a little more at home in my own skin. I started picking up hobbies I'd long set aside. Reading, hiking, even going to a local bar for open mic nights. These small, ordinary things felt new and exciting, like rediscovering pieces of myself I'd forgotten in the wake of trying to build a life with Laura. I began to realize just how much of myself I'd lost in trying to fit into her world, in bending to accommodate her dreams while letting mine slip away. One evening, as I sat outside the trailer, watching the sun dip below the horizon, I felt a strange sense of gratitude. The bitterness was fading, replaced by a quiet appreciation for the lessons I'd learned. I wasn't the same man who'd walked into that motel room, heartbroken and enraged. 
I was someone different now, someone stronger, someone who understood his own worth. A month after the divorce was finalized, I was invited to a small get-together by some friends from work. I hesitated at first, feeling out of practice with socializing, but I decided to go, pushing myself to embrace the freedom I'd fought so hard for. That's where I met Diane. She was a friend of a friend, standing by the punch bowl, laughing at something one of our mutual friends had said. Her laughter was genuine, the kind that fills a room and draws attention to the person saying it. We struck up a conversation, casual at first, exchanging pleasantries, but as the night went on I found myself opening up in a way I hadn't with anyone in a long time. She listened, not in the way people do out of politeness, but with real interest, as if every word mattered. She shared her own stories, too, about her love for travel, her job as a freelance writer, and her recent move to our small town in search of a simpler life. With Diane, there was no rush, no pressure. We met for coffee a few days later, then for dinner the next week. Each time it felt easy and natural, like I was reconnecting with a part of myself rather than trying to impress someone else. She wasn't looking for grand gestures or promises. She was content with the small things, the quiet moments that made life feel rich and meaningful. One night, uh, as we walked along the river under the stars, she turned to me and said, uh, Jacob, I, I don't know your whole story, but I can see you've been through a lot. I just hope you know you deserve happiness, whatever that means for you. Her words hit me deeply, the truth of them settling in. For so long I'd been wrapped up in the idea that my happiness was tied to someone else's dreams, someone else's expectations. But now... I realized that happiness was something I could define for myself, a new beginning shaped by my own choices, not by someone else's ambitions. Months passed, and my life began to take on a new rhythm. I'd moved out of the trailer into a modest little house near the edge of town, a place with just enough space to feel like home, without overwhelming me. Each room felt like a fresh start, a canvas waiting for my own memories and experiences. I'd decorated it with things that mattered to me, books I'd collected, photographs from hiking trips, little mementos that reminded me of the journey I'd been on. The divorce, once a painful wait, had become a turning point, a stepping stone toward something better. I realized I was no longer defined by my relationship with Laura or by the hurt she left behind. I was Jacob, a man who'd been tested and emerged stronger, more self-aware, and ready for whatever life had in store. My relationship with Diane grew slowly, naturally, without the rush or pressure that had characterized my marriage. She understood me in a way that felt effortless, a kind of acceptance that made each day feel like a gift. There was no need to impress her. No need to be anything other than who I was, and in that simplicity, I found something I hadn't known I was searching for. Peace. Uh, one evening, as we sat together on my back porch watching the sunset, I looked over at her, feeling a quiet sense of happiness. Uh, thank you, I murmured. She looked at me, puzzled. For what? For reminding me that I can be happy again, I replied, my voice soft but sure. She reached over, taking my hand, her smile warm and reassuring. And in that moment, I knew that this was my new beginning, a fresh chapter filled with hope, love, and the simple joy of moving forward. I'd found my way out of the shadows of the past, stepping into a future that for the first time felt entirely mine. As time moved on, my life settled into a comforting rhythm, a gentle pace that allowed me to appreciate each day for what it was. Diane and I grew closer in a way that felt natural and unforced, as though we'd found each other at just the right moment. Our days were filled with quiet mornings, sipping coffee, evenings spent watching the sun slip below the horizon, 
and weekend hikes through the winding trails near town. It was a new kind of happiness, one that didn't demand anything of me but my presence, my willingness to be in the moment. There was a particular evening that still lingers in my mind, one of those perfect, quiet nights that reminded me how far I'd come. Diane and I were sitting on the porch, wrapped in blankets as we watched the stars emerge one by one. The night was calm, the air cool, and a soft breeze stirred the trees, creating a gentle rustle that seemed to underscore our silence. Do you ever think about your past? She asked softly, her voice barely more than a whisper, as though speaking too loudly might shatter the peace. I nodded, taking a slow breath. I do. Sometimes it feels like another life, like someone else lived through all of that. Other times, I paused, glancing down at my hands. Other times, it feels like it's still a part of me, you know? Like those memories are woven into who I am, even if I'm no longer living in them. She gave a small understanding smile. I think that's how it's supposed to be. We carry pieces of the past with us, but we don't let them define us. Her words resonated with a truth I hadn't been able to put into words. I'd spent so long looking back, haunted by regrets and wondering if things could have been different. But sitting here with Diane, under a sky full of stars, I realized that the past was just that, a place I'd been, lessons I'd learned, but not a place I needed to stay. As the days continued, Diane became more than just someone I shared my time with. She was a partner in the truest sense, someone who knew my story and saw beyond it. With her, I found acceptance not just of who I was, but of everything I'd been through. Uh, she didn't need me to be perfect or healed or even entirely sure of where I was going. She was content to walk beside me, wherever that path might lead. One weekend, we decided to take a trip to a small lakeside cabin Diana knew of. It was secluded, surrounded by towering pines with a view of the water that stretched on for miles. As we unpacked, I couldn't help but feel a sense of nostalgia, a memory of past trips I'd taken and dreams I'd once had. But this was different. It wasn't a vacation from something, a temporary escape from a life that felt too heavy. It was simply a new experience, a quiet retreat with someone who felt like home. That evening we sat by the lake, the water reflecting the colors of the setting sun. Diane leaned against me, her head on my shoulder, as we watched the sky shift from orange to purple to the deep blue of night. There was no need for words. The moment held a calmness I hadn't realized I'd been searching for. Thank you for bringing me here, I said finally, breaking the silence. She looked up at me, her eyes warm. Thank you for coming with me, she replied. It feels like the beginning of something, doesn't it? I nodded, feeling a sense of hope I hadn't allowed myself to feel in years. It does, I murmured. A beginning. And maybe the end of something else. As the stars began to sprinkle the sky, I felt a surge of peace that had been missing for too long. For the first time, I felt like I was standing firmly on my own two feet, with no shadows from the past clinging to my shoulders. The ache of the past was still there, but it had softened, becoming part of the landscape of who I was rather than a weight I needed to carry. The next morning, as we packed up to leave, Diane handed me a small, smooth stone she'd picked up by the water's edge. To remember this weekend, she said with a smile, pressing it into my palm. I held it in my hand, feeling its cool surface, its solid weight. It was a simple thing, just a stone, but it felt like a symbol of this new chapter, a reminder that I could take pieces of each experience with me even as I moved forward. Driving back, I felt a quiet anticipation about the future. I knew there would be more memories to make, more challenges to face, but I was ready. With Diane beside me and a newfound understanding of myself, I knew I was prepared for whatever lay ahead. There was no need to dwell on what might have been. 
The past had been laid to rest, and in its place was a life filled with possibility. Looking over at Diane, her hand resting on mine, I realized that this was my happiness, my new beginning. And as we drove down that winding road, with the sun rising in the distance, I felt a deep, unshakable certainty that I was exactly where I was meant to be. As the months passed, I found myself drifting between moments of introspection, like layers of memory and understanding unfolding with each quiet day. There was a calm now, a quietness in my life that I hadn't realized I was craving. This calmness felt like both a gift and a responsibility, a space to truly look inward and confront what had brought me to this point. Sitting alone one evening as the twilight crept across the walls of my new home, I let myself think back over everything. The old pain and anger had softened, but the questions still lingered, and I knew they might always be there in some form. Why had I held on so tightly to a life that clearly hadn't been right for me? Why had I chosen to ignore the signs, to believe in a version of love that had demanded so much of me and given so little in return? The answers weren't clear-cut, but as I reflected I began to understand that it wasn't just about Laura or the life we'd tried to build, it was about my own need for certainty, my tendency to tie my worth to someone else's happiness. I'd wanted so desperately to be needed, to feel valued, that I'd sacrificed parts of myself along the way. My self-worth had become tangled up in someone else's journey, and in doing so I'd lost sight of my own. W would, would the realization was both painful and liberating. For the first time I saw my mistakes as lessons rather than failures. I'd poured my heart into something that ultimately wasn't meant to be, and while that had hurt, it didn't define who I was. I was learning that I could rebuild, that I could redefine what I wanted out of life, uh, not based on someone else's goals, but, but on my own dreams and needs. Diane, as always, was a steady presence, her understanding as deep and unspoken as the way she'd taken my hand that night by the lake. She never pushed me to open up or demanded more than I was ready to give. In her quiet, unassuming way, she showed me that love could be simple and steady, that it didn't have to be a fight or a sacrifice. Being with her was a reminder that love could be peaceful, even healing, and it was through her gentle companionship that I started to see myself in a new light. One afternoon, Diane and I took a hike up to a small ridge overlooking the valley. We'd packed sandwiches and a thermos of coffee, planning to spend the day in nature, away from everything else. As we reached the top, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude for the journey, for the challenges, even for the heartache that had brought me here. She sat beside me, leaning her head on my shoulder as we looked out over the endless stretch of green and golden fields below. I took a deep breath, feeling the crisp air fill my lungs, grounding me in the present. It's beautiful, isn't it? She whispered, her voice soft and filled with wonder. It really is, I replied, my own voice barely audible. But I wasn't just talking about the view. I was thinking of everything, the whole mess of experiences that had brought me to this moment. For the first time, I felt like I could appreciate it all, the good, the painful, the mistakes, and the growth, as part of a whole that made sense. Turning to Diane, I took her hand in mine, feeling a quiet resolve settle within me. I, I think, I think I'm finally ready to let go, I said, surprised at my own words, but knowing they were true. To stop looking back and really start living in the present. She smiled, a warmth in her eyes that told me she understood. I think you've been doing that all along, Jacob, she said giving my hand a gentle squeeze. Sometimes we just need to say it out loud to believe it. Her words echoed in my mind long after that day. I'd spent so much time holding on to the past, clinging to what I thought life was supposed to be, that I hadn't fully realized how much I'd already moved forward. Diane's presence had shown me a new way of loving and living, 
and as I embraced this new chapter, I felt the weight of old expectations slipping away, leaving room for something deeper, something real. Back at home I started small projects, things I'd always wanted to do but had never taken the time for. I signed up for a pottery class at the community center, let myself get lost in the creative process. I planted a small garden in the backyard, watching as new life sprouted, a reminder of growth and renewal. Each day, I felt more certain that I was creating a life for myself, a life shaped by my choices, my values, and the quiet dreams I was beginning to uncover. The past wasn't something to be erased. It was part of my journey, part of who I'd become. But it no longer defined me. It was simply a foundation upon which I could build something new, something stronger. Sitting in the soft glow of the sunset one evening, I realized that I'd found a happiness that didn't rely on anyone else's approval or validation. It was mine, born from resilience and the courage to face the truth. And as I watched the light fade into dusk, I felt a quiet contentment, a peace that came from knowing that I was finally home, in my heart, in my life, and in my future. In the end, the story conveys the message that life is not only about what we lose, but also about what we learn and rebuild from it.